All right, Shalom, all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, by Hashem, Yahweh Shai, by Hashem, Habrakakwadash, Barakatham, double honors to the apostles of Great Millstone, and peace and salutation to the elect Akim out here during this fight, pushing this word with faith, hope, and sincerity. So uh, I've been doing, you know, just some research past couple of weeks um, on race, and um, I ran across this book. And uh, I just want to read a couple paragraphs, uh, which Lord willing will be edifying, you know, to you brothers and, you know, you hopeful sisters that listen. Um, and there's a few things that I want to just cover about racism uh, here in America, uh, because clearly it's not identified uh, by the so-called white people, Edomites, as being an issue. Um, and basically it's pushed towards our people, Israelites, so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans, that we should just get over it and that we are basically imagining something that isn't really happening. So, uh, like I said, I, there's just a few paragraphs I want to read um, about this book um, and uh, bring out some scriptures. And Lord willing, it'll be edifying for the elect. It says racial domination, racial Progress, society, the social, the sociology of race in America, and uh, I'm gonna start right here at the very top. It says, Chapter One: Race in the 21st Century, a Cancer. As we enter a promising new millennium, we continue to be confronted with a problem as old as America itself. That problem is the problem of the color line. It is the problem of racism, of inequality and privilege, of the suffering and oppression of some groups of people at the hands of, other, of another. Some people, however, have argued that in these modern times, there is no problem at all. A growing number of commentators from political leaders to radio talk show hosts have suggested that race no longer matters. They have boasted that we have a mere 40 years after the civil rights movement reached the promised land that Martin Luther King Jr. so eloquently described in one of his of the most famous speeches of the last century, the I Have a Dream speech delivered on August 28th. 1963 we have arrived they say at true multiculturalism we are living in a so-called colorblind society in which people are judged in king's words not by the color of their skin but by the content of their character does such an optimistic idea truly reflect the state of america today and the answer is no and it will never reflect the state of quote unquote America because America in itself was founded by bloodshed. Okay. I'm going to continue. It says in some respects, we have good reason to be optimistic. Thanks to the brave activists of the civil rights movement, the United States no longer upholds legally enforced residential, educational, and economic segregation, which, um, uh, we really need our people do not need to be co-mingled or co-habitate uh, with these Edomite so-called white people but you know once again this is just someone's perspective I'm gonna get to the point it says most of us will not experience grotesque acts of racial violence that many people of color experienced 50 years ago well not until martial law it says a number of social Institutions, moreover, have been thoroughly integrated, most notably the American military. The black middle class and the Hispanic middle class have grown. American Indian nations have developed effective economic development strategies based on the principle of tribal sovereignty. Asian Americans have made impressive inroads into positions of influence in politics, science, business, and the arts. There are other encouraging trends as well in religion, 
sports, the mass media, voluntary associations, and other significant areas in American life. In politics, one need only say the name Barack Obama, and in the social and cultural order, Americans are beginning to appreciate the inherent value and dignity of all persons, regardless of their origins or skin color. And let me add a quick point that Barack Obama is not an Israelite, okay? He is a Hamite, okay? His father goes back to so-called Africans, okay? He is not an Israelite. It says, this is especially true of the youth who in terms of their racial and ethnic attitudes are probably the most open-minded and tolerant generation in U.S. history. And today, many corporations universities, organizations, and congregations consider racial and ethnic diversity an asset to be fostered and sought after, not a problem to be avoided. To say that nothing has gotten better certainly would be inaccurate. But has racism been completely vanquished? Let's take a glance at race relations in the United States to find out. And before that, I'm going to bring out a quick scripture. Um, This is Ecclesiastes 10 and 5. It says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceeded from the ruler. And that error that's proceeded from the ruler, okay, is the creation of racism, okay? The belief that so-called white people are better than any other people on the face of this earth. That was a creation that Edomites, so-called white people created, which is the reason why they're able to use it as a tool or a weapon against our people to have them mentally, physically, and spiritually afraid of Esau, the so-called white man, okay? And, And actually these paragraphs are gonna get into it. It says, But has racism been completely vanquished? Let's take a glance at race relations in the United States to find out. The FBI tallied 7,649 incidents of hate crime that took place in 2004 alone. This number is underestimated because it only accounts for those crimes reported to the FBI by participating law enforcement agencies. These offenses include intimidation, destruction of property, and vandalism, assault, burglary, murder, and rape. Race-based hate crimes accounted for 53% of the total number of offenses, and religion-based crimes accounted for 18%. 67% of the race-based hate crimes were committed against black people, so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans. Okay, well, excuse me. Uh, just uh, the tribe of Judah, okay? It says, and 68% of the hate crimes motivated by religious bias were anti-Semitic acts, which we know is a lie because we're, we're Shemitic people, okay? It says, between 1995 and 2004, the FBI has documented 80,000 separate hate crimes more than half of which were motivated by racial hatred. In 2005, 37 million Americans lived in poverty. With with poverty rates of 25% Native Americans and African Americans, but basically Israelites, okay? Because we know that these are terms that Esau created. Native Americans and African Americans were the poorest racial groups in the nation, okay? 22% of Hispanic Americans lived in poverty. Only 10% of Asian American and 8% of white Americans lived under similar harsh economic conditions. Okay, let's get back to the scripture. This is Ecclesiastes 10 and 5. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceeded from the ruler. That ruler being Esau, the so-called white man, pursuant to Job 9 and 24, the earth being given unto the hand of the wicked and that's the evil okay I mean there's a multitude of evils but specifically the creation of race 
But not only that, uh, the separation of class, okay? It says, folly is set in great dignity and the rich sit in a low place. That rich is talking about the Israelites because we are the ones that are rich with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of these holy scriptures. Verse 7, I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. And, and these servants that are upon horses are these Edomites, okay? Which are the ones that are turning really everything upside down. And those princes are talking about Israelites, so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans. But when we read in this article, it says 37 million Americans lived in poverty with poverty rates of 25% Native Americans and African Americans were the poorest racial groups in the nation. But as scripture says, but we are rich. We're just not rich in the financial institution that was created by Esau. Our riches are, are stored up in heaven, okay, for the return of Yahweh Shai and the deliverance of the elect. Th then that's when you will see, you will see princes, okay, on horses, and you will see servants walking as servants, okay, upon the earth. Those servants uh, are there talking about Esau, the so-called white man, walking as servants, okay, until eradication. Let's continue. It says 4% of whites suffered from unemployment while that percentage jumped to 5.6 for Hispanics and more than doubled to 9.2 for blacks. Since 1940, the unemployment rate of African Americans has been nearly twice that of whites. And, and this is not a mistake. This is a plan. This is, this is the creation of racial division. Okay, to where they can remain, quote unquote, on top. Okay, but this is just like a backdrop type of lesson, you know, to where you can understand the, the cards are stacked against us, which is why we always reference that we are in captivity. Okay, this is really no different than the 1800s or the 1700s. Just because you have some, uh, 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 quote unquote, privileges and luxuries, nothing has changed, okay? Since 1940, the unemployment rate of African Americans has been nearly twice that of whites, and over half the Native Americans living on some reservations are unemployed. It says over half. Despite these vast inequalities, 50% of whites recently surveyed believe that the average African American and the average white person are equally well off. <laughs> See, they're delusional, man. You know, scripture says that the Lord was going to choose their delusions, man. Let's continue. It says, many of us watched as Hurricane Katrina ravaged New Orleans, exposing, exposing deep racial and class cleavages between more affluent residents who had the means to leave the city and the swelling ranks of the vulnerable inner city poor who were left behind to face the storm. Thousands of residents, most of whom were African American, were stranded in the city for days. As the body count grew larger and larger by the day, it became evident that one could not begin to comprehend what happened in New Orleans without a full-bodied understanding of social exclusion, politically enforced marginality, an ongoing process of racism, okay? Because clearly, the quote-unquote government, okay, had the resources available to do what? To make sure everyone was at least taken to higher ground and avoided being uh, killed uh, through the devastation. But we also understand all of these despairing uh, injustices are promoted by Esau, the so-called white man. Every government function, every uh, uh, job created, it's not for you Israelites. These jobs are created either for expatriates, okay, which is another reason why Trump wants to uh, build this wall, one, one of the many reasons, okay, but also to create Jacob's trouble. But everything economically, financially, 
even the clothes. I mean, I'm sure brothers have seen in the past couple of weeks, the people that had to have these fashion industries and companies and luxury brands, they're not selling it to you. You are completely devalued here. But the reason why I'm, I'm bringing that up is because I'm going to read this last statement again. It says, it became evident that one could not begin to comprehend what happened in New Orleans without a full-bodied understanding of social exclusion. Okay? You know, these same people that claim, oh, we're all equal, we're all gods. But clearly in this episode, our people were excluded intentionally. Understanding of social exclusion, politically enforced marginality, and ongoing process of racism. During a televised fundraising event, hip-hop star Kanye West vented, George Bush doesn't care about black people. Likewise, many Americans began asking how the richest country in the world could maroon thousands of people in such a devastated urban wasteland for days. But in truth, we have been marooning our urban poor in substandard conditions for years. Let's bring out another scripture. Um, God, this is... Uh, this is Ecclesiastes 5 and 13. There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. You know? And and, and that's exactly what, what these Edomites do, man. They keep all the riches to themselves, but, you know, as Scripture says, riches won't profit in the day of adversity. So it's a good thing that our people are poor because it, it makes them depend solely on your how by Shemiah was shot. Let's read verse uh, 14. But those riches perish by evil travail. And he beget it a son, and there is nothing in his hand. You know? And and really, that's twofold, because our people don't have an inheritance or, or, or a heritage, uh, per se, in this society. Okay? Because our riches are in, and, and our inheritance is in the kingdom. Okay? Uh, let me see. Yeah, let me read the rest of this. It says, as he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to, to go as he came and shall nothing and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a sore evil that all points as he came. So shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? Because really, as scripture says in Micah, Chapter 2, verse 10, this is not our rest, man. So, so although Esau has created, you know, this system to where clearly um, we're not going to receive any help. The reason why I'm sharing this, this information is because this information is vital to, to our people understanding. Even if you don't understand the scriptures, you can understand that there is an evil that has, has been created in this world. You might not know exactly who it is, but these lessons are to help you spiritually identify who the devil is. And that's Esau, the so-called white man. Let's continue. Today, nearly 7 million people are either serving time in prison, being held in country jail, yep, in country jails, awaiting trial, or under probation or parole supervision. Almost 6 million Americans are either in prison or have been locked up at some point in their lives that amounts to one in 37 Americans. Indeed, the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. <laughs> it's crazy, bro. It says, uh, severe racial inequalities are at work within the criminal justice system. African Americans are eight times more likely to be incarcerated than whites. Among black men born in the late 1960s who did not earn a high school diploma, 60% had prison records by the time they reached the age of 35. Sociologists and criminologists have demonstrated that racial inequalities in the justice system are largely accounted for by examining how racial exclusion has resulted in high concentrations of poor African Americans and Latinos living in inner city areas that offer little to no opportunity 
for economic advancement or survival. So it's not that our people are dumb or quote unquote lazy, okay? It's the amount of opportunities that are not present in those poor or socio-economical challenged areas because Esau hoards all the riches quote unquote to himself because as I said earlier his system quote unquote America is not for you so called Negroes Latinos and, and Native Americans and he makes it evident every day don't believe me look at the prison rates he does not want you to enjoy the, the quote unquote um, I was going to say fruits of his labor but he doesn't even have any labor Unless you just want to call killing people a labor. And that's what he does for fun. Let's continue. And there's only a couple of paragraphs left. Lord willing, you brothers, uh, bear with me. It says, given these facts, facts that barely scratch the surface of the problem, can we confidently conclude that race does not matter today? Would such logic be acceptable when considering other types of problems? Consider, for an example, cancer. What if a group of citizens suddenly declared that cancer is, is not a problem anymore? We solved cancer years ago, they might say. Surely upon hearing such a bold proclamation, we would examine the facts, which would overwhelmingly dispute the claim. We would point to the 10 million Americans with a history of cancer as well as the 1 million Americans expected to be victims of cancer this year we would identify the symptoms of cancer man, we would identify the symptoms of cancer manifest in manifest in fever fatigue pain sores bleeding lumps and so forth we would consult doctors and epidemiologists demiologists who have documented case after case of abnormal cell growth and tumor development. In short, we would disavow the claim that cancer was cured long ago, simply by pointing to the plethora of effects, signs, and symptoms of cancer obvious in everyday life. The same logic applies to social diseases. Above, we listed some symptoms of racism, evidence that race indeed is a fundamental part of, of everyday life. Race penetrates all aspects of our lives, our history, our collective memory, our schools, our jobs, our streets. It structures the inner workings of our hospitals, our prison, prisons, our bastions, our bastions of political power and our economy. We witness its effect on our art, our entertainment, and our churches, mosques, and synagogues. Our intimate relationships, the relationships we have with family, friends, lovers, leaders, role models, heroes, enemies, teachers, landlords, and supervisors are influenced by our relations of race. Race is even, race is even there in the basic ways we understand ourselves. It informs our inner thoughts and indeed our very identities as people. Life in America and indeed life around the globe is a life saturated with the reality of race. This reality of race, like many other social realities, has grown adept at shape-shifting, <laughs> ooh, not shape-shifting. This reality of race, like many other social realities, has grown adept at shape-shifting. Unlike cancer, which looks the same as it did 100 years ago, the racism of our generation looks different from the racism from the racism our parents witnessed, which of course looked different from the racism. It says, which of course looked different from the racism their parents witnessed. 
Racism is mercurial, ever-changing. Okay, let's get this word here, mercurial. Mercurial. It says, of a person, subject or sudden, sudden or unpredictable changes of mood or mind. Okay, it says volatile, uh, capricious, temperamental, okay, fickle, changeable, unpredictable, okay? So all of these things is exactly what racism is, okay? No matter if you have your hands up, you have a hoodie on, you can be walking backwards, okay? You can, quote unquote, do all of the uh, American, quote unquote, traditions, None of those things matter because race was created as a weapon against Israelites. All right. This is, uh, this is Ecclesiastes chapter six, verse one. There's an evil, which I have seen under the sun and it is common among men, a man to whom Yahweh hath given riches, wealth and honor so that he wanted nothing for his soul of all that he desired yet Yahweh giveth him not power to eat thereof okay see this this is a part of the curses it says but a stranger eateth it this is vanity this is vanity and it is an evil disease okay because that's exactly what we're talking about right now okay racism being a disease which was created to spread or a cancer to spread amongst our people okay better yet I'll give it a, a, a stronger word okay which is witchcraft okay or sorcery that's exactly what racism is okay it says racism is mercurial ever changing 21st century patterns of racial stigmas stigma stigmatization exclusion repression as well as promises of racial reconciliation and multicultural coalitions do not immediately resemble those of the 20th century although racial violence still occurs in America today there are fewer victim victims than there were in the previous generation and although many high schools universities neighborhood job sites nursing homes country clubs restaurants and parks remain segregated along lines of race this racial segregation is no longer enforced by law today's racism is not always obvious it can be slippery elusive to observation and analysis like a recessive tumor 21st century racism has disguised itself calling itself by other names and cloaking itself behind seemingly race neutral laws policies practices and language but it is still with us influencing our relationships our institutions and our world and it will not simply fade out of existence if we turn a blind eye toward it a tumor will destroy a body regardless of whether it bear its bearer recognizes it or not this is uh proverbs chapter 8 verse i'm gonna start at uh i'm gonna start at verse 8 con it says all the words of my mouth are in righteousness there is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understand it and right to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. And, and those witty inventions is what Esau has created, okay? A cancer by the name of racism. And it's used as a weapon, a biological weapon, a spiritual weapon to destroy our people and to have them not understand their rightful position in this earth as Israelites, okay? Not 
to be concerned with titles such as African American, Afro American, Black, Negro, all of these invented names. Let's continue. It says, we should also keep in mind that present day society is directed by the past, by the past. History structures the workings of today in innumerable ways, some of which are so deeply familiar to us that we fail to notice them. In the words of Emily Durkham, a French sociologist and one of the founding fathers of the discipline, or Emile, Emily, Emile, not sure, it says, in each one of us, in different degrees, is contained the person we were yesterday. See, and that's a spiritual statement. It says, the present, the present is necessarily is necessarily insignificant when compared with the long period of the past because of which we have emerged in the form we have today. If the world we occupy is shaped by the struggles of yesterday, then we cannot divide past racism from present racism in a hard and fast, fast manner. What is more racially what is more racial inequalities as well as racial privileges accumulate over generations. In other words, our standing in today's world largely is di dictated by the ways in which our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents were treated during their own lifetimes. Okay? So this is going to show you about lineage and how the state in which we're in today is based on the 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 sins and the iniquities of our forefathers. But likewise, Esau, the so-called white man, is here because of the atrocities in which he did towards our forefathers, okay, which has given him the position in which he's in today. None of those things have lost symmetry, okay? They're all following the same timeline of seed, okay, which goes back to nation, your nation, your nationality. When you break down the word nation, it goes back to the to the root of um, natal, okay, where the womb is, okay. That is your nation from which you were born, but the the man carries the seed, okay. It says, if our parents suffered from systematic social exclusion and discrimination based on their race, then many aspects of our lives, our economic and educational opportunities, for example, will be disadvantaged. In the same way, if our parents benefited from the very race-based methods of social exclusion and discrimination that caused the parents of some of our peers to suffer, then we will enjoy a certain degree of privilege in today's society, the accruing afflictions or affluence of our mothers and fathers are visited upon us, sons and daughters. And this is just to show you that people understand that there isn't just a one period episode of how things have gotten to this point or how they have evolved to this point. Okay. Everything was written before time. And as scripture says, there's nothing new under the sun which is the reason why the situation in which we're in is strictly based upon our actions, okay, in which we're uh, predestined, okay, some righteous, some unrighteous, but for the wicked Esau, the so-called white man, all of his actions were predestined as well to be the wicked, to create uh, 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 racism, okay, to come up with terms such as black and white, all right? But I want to read this last part again. It says the accruing afflictions or affluence of our mothers and fathers are visited upon us, sons and daughters. Now, where have I heard that before in the scriptures? OK, this is Exodus 34 and 7. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. Meaning that there is one, there is a nation, there's people 
that are are completely guilty, okay, which do not have the opportunity at forgiveness of sins. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Exodus 20 and 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy power am a jealous power, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. So once again, going to show you that the Lord is going to visit that iniquity. Because two-thirds of our people hate Yahweh by Shai. All right? Uh, one more verse. This is Numbers 14 and 18. The Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Okay? So now let's read that sentence again. It says, The accruing afflictions or affluence of our mothers and fathers are visited upon us, sons and daughters. So, if we were the ones being afflicted, which our people were, okay, it's now on us, that situation. But that affluence, which was based on these Edomites, they are the ones that their sons and daughters are now in positions of power, okay? And you look at all of the Bushes, the, the uh, quote-unquote global elite families, all that theft, robbery, murdering, and killing, which is, is the reason why they're in office and they're doing all of these glorious things, but it fell on the sons and daughters that affluence or lies and, and destruction in which their mothers and fathers did is going to be visited upon the sons and daughters. Likewise, the iniquity, okay, of those people, these Edomites, these other heathen nations, and two-thirds of our people will be visited upon the sons and the daughters currently, okay? It said unto the third and fourth generation. All right, let's wrap up. I think this is the last. Okay, one more paragraph. It says, To illustrate this point, let us let us examine different levels of wealth. Oh, I wanted to cover this as well real quick. So lock it. Now, this says average family net worth by race in 2007 in terms of dollars. Okay? So this is $35,000 in 1992. Now, this says net worth. This doesn't say just income this says net worth and so let's get what net worth really is okay it says net worth what is net worth net worth is the amount by which assets exceed liabilities net worth is a concept applicable to individuals and business businesses as a key measure of how much an entity is worth a consistent increase in net worth indicates good financial health Conversely, net worth may be depleted by annual operating losses or a substantial decrease in asset asset values relative to liabilities. So we're going to play a little bit of this real quick. Net worth is the amount by which assets exceed liabilities. Another way to say this is it's the value of everything you own minus all your debts. Net worth is a concept that can be applied to both individuals and businesses as a measure of how much they are really worth. In the corporate world, net worth is also called book value or shareholders equity. The word net in financial language means after subtracting expenses and debts. A consistent increase in net worth Worth means assets are growing faster than debts and indicates good financial health. Okay, so let's let's go back to the chart real quick. It says a average family net worth by race. Okay, white, so-called African American, so-called Latino. Okay, in the year 1992. Okay, net worth meaning that after you paid out all of your liabilities, how much money do you have left over? Okay. And I, and I believe that, yeah, this is in dollars. So by each year, let me make for sure. Yep. So the average so-called white uh, family net worth was an additional or, or they, they actually had $26,000 left at the end of the year. Okay. Which I'm sure a lot of so-called Negroes, Latinos and Native American families have never seen that type of money. I know I haven't. 
Okay. Now we look at so-called African American. Okay, twenty-five hundred dollars. That's it. At the end of the year, compared to ten times that. Okay. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Ten times. Well, almost twelve, thirteen times that. Okay. And then for the Latino. 1700 and then as you can see it's 92 95 98 and 2001 now if you notice something here for so-called african-americans we just hover around 2500 dollars that's it you know and, and and that's lucky that's good so let's let's show the converse side of that um net worth equation Conversely, when liabilities grow faster than assets, or when the value of assets drop, net worth decreases, indicating financial problems. What is the Joneses' net worth? They have a home valued at $250,000, an investment portfolio of $100,000, and... See, first of all, none of this is accurate for Jake, you know? But, but all of this is just to show how this system is not created for us, okay? Automobiles and other assets worth $25,000. Their liabilities are a mortgage balance of $100,000 and a car loan of $10,000. By adding the assets and subtracting the liabilities, we find the Joneses' net worth is $265,000. So now, if you go back here, like I said, our, our people don't, don't have this. Now, this was in 2007, of course, but, I mean, not much has changed. Uh, well, yeah, this was in 2007, but what I'm saying is these numbers were based upon that study at 2007. And none of these numbers are changing. So so the point here is this. There, there is no winning in quote-unquote Esau society. It's not meant for our people to win. That That is another part of his witchcraft. Now, five years later, the Joneses' financial position has changed. Their home value has decreased to $225,000. Their investment portfolio has increased to $120,000. They now have savings of $20,000, and their car and other assets have decreased to $15,000. On the liabilities side, their mortgage balance has dropped to $80,000, and they've paid off their car loan. By adding assets and subtracting liabilities, their net worth is now $300,000. In other words, despite the decrease in value of their home and car, the couple's net worth increased by $35,000. This is because the decreases were more than offset by increases in other assets and... Yeah, so, I mean, like I said, essentially, I just wanted to share that real quick before I finish this off. It says, to illustrate this point, let us examine different levels of wealth, a topic to which we return in a later chapter. While 61% of black families possess absolutely no net financial assets, only 25% of white households are in a similar pinch. In explaining this wide gap between white and black levels of wealth, social, social scientists have demonstrated that parents' net worth is the single best predictor of the net worth of young families. Your level of wealth is primarily dictated by the wealth of your parents. Your parents' wealth is determined not only by what their parents pass down to them, but also by the advantages or disadvantages they faced in the labor market. So once again, going to show you how nothing has changed. There's always going to be a disadvantage towards Israelites which is part of the reason why this gap is always going to be that, that way, okay? And then there's a uh, matter of fact, yeah, if you brothers haven't seen this video, look it up, the unequal opportunity race. And, and it'll, it'll show you exactly why there is no quote-unquote catching up to Esau system, all right? Um, let's see here. It says, your level of wealth is primarily dictated by the wealth of your parents, your parents' Wealth is determined not only by what their parents passed down to them, but also by the advantages or disadvantages they faced in the labor market. Historically, the labor market has been soaked through with legacies of racist policies and processes of exclusion. Nobody wants Edomites. So like it. Edomites don't want any Israelites around them. It's evident. It says this is why 
the authors of Whitewashing Race point out that an analysis of racial inequalities in the distribution of wealth explodes explodes any distinction between past and present racism. Today's inequalities in wealth reflect the legacies of slavery, Jim Crow, and labor market dis- discrimination. We need to recognize that we are all inheritors of the history of our parents and of our society. And all of this was created, you know. All of this was created as a quote-unquote justification of Israelite uh Salakia of Edomites to discriminate Israelites because America is a playland for for Edomites it's a captivity for Israelites last paragraph I'm gonna wrap up says racism persists as the cancer of American life pervasive corrosive dehumanizing and deadly modern day racism infects the health of our society it is our responsibility then as students of society and as future citizens of our communities to understand the realities of racism as citizens of a world that grows more racially diverse every year we must understand how race and racism work and we must develop tools to analyze the social creation that is responsible for so many cleavages and inequalities in our world today. Uh, Basically, they go in to talk about the book. It says this book aims uh, to do just that. It seeks to explain the inner logic of race and racism and to describe the nature of race relations in the present day. So anyway, like I said, I mean, it was something that uh, clearly uh, struck my attention because it kind of gave some good scenarios and details on how uh, history in itself reflects uh, racism being used as a weapon towards our people, uh, regardless of if you know our people want to recognize it or not. It's clearly evident and and it's put in our face every day. But yet and still, our people um, some fail to realize it. Uh, but they will realize um, very soon uh, when you know th- this race war kicks off. And as Scripture says, uh, hold on one second. Let me grab that. God, this is uh, Joel 3, and I'm going to start at 7. It says, Behold, I will raise them out of the place whether ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. So, so yeah, people are going to start to understand that, hey, everyone is not alike, okay? There are different na- uh, nationalities, not races in the world. It says, And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the uh, Sabians and to, the, and to a people far off. For the Lord hath spoken it. Procla- proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men and let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Okay? Assemble yourselves and come together. All ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about thither. Cause thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Okay, let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Okay, uh, might as well finish it off. It says, "Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflowing, for their wickedness is great." So, yeah, the Lord's not going to have any mercy on, on these people, whether or not they identify with this truth being told to them or not. OK, all of this was a creation. OK, and, and Lord willing, uh, I'll, I'll have a, um, a follow up to this uh, that I'm going to do here. And, um, you know, Lord willing, y'all brothers, check it out. Uh, but with that being said, I'd like to say, call halal, like how by Shim, y'all shot by Shim, Rakak, Wadash, double honors to the apostles of Great Millstone who teach and rule well. And peace and salutation to the elect Akim out here and during this fight, pushing this word with faith, hope, and sincerity. Until the next time, I'm going to say, Shalom.